the oath, the coronation, and the truth. King Charles will swear an oath following the terms of the Coronation Oath Act 1688. He will also swear the Accession Declaration Oath, confirming that he is a faithful Protestant. Law, in its majesty, prohibits Catholics from taking the throne. This is strange, bizarre. The poet Fernando Pessoa nailed it in the Book of Disquiet. The oath marks the point at which solemnly spoken words become a figure of the supernatural. The oath transforms the physical body of the king into a figure of the beyond. The king becomes, rather like David Bowie, something of an extraterrestrial, or at least the one who can mediate between two worlds, the divine world and our world. What better way of securing a polity than asserting that the constitution rests in the hands of the deity's representative on earth? Of course, we do not need to think in these terms. On a slightly different point, the European Court of Human Rights pointed out that the parliamentary oath may invoke the crown, but it expresses loyalty to constitutional principles, which support the workings of a representative democracy. Is this the real meaning of the oath that Charles swears? It'd be hard to square this with the precise terms of the oath itself. The oath is a formula of words that Charles III must utter to become his numeral. There is a voluntary oath that we have been invited to swear. While British subjects watch the coronation on screens at home in parks and pubs across the country, they will be asked to join together and repeat the following words. I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. A voluntary oath, surely, loses some of the ritual charge of an obligatory oath of office. It's a particularly dumbed-down way of entering the mystical body of the king. Whilst a voluntary oath is not as charged as an obligatory oath, it remains something that one can choose not to swear. Even so, the chorus of a million voices presses into service a symbol, or given that many will be in pubs or otherwise well lubricated, something of a sing-along, or even the call and response of a pantomime. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche had something to say about oaths. In book three of The Dawn of the Day, he re recommended the following oath, which dispensed with any invocation of deity. If I am now telling a lie, I am no longer an honourable man, and every one may say so to my face. If this does not invoke the deity, then it might be something of a break with oaths that define mystical bodies. Nietzsche's oath, fitting for a philosopher, firms the honour of the one who tells the truth, and the truth is hard cannot be a rehearsed formula of words. An honourable truth about history and historical legacies of belonging, forced belonging or not belonging, is even harder to put into words. You can join in the chorus affirming the voluntary oath, remain silent, turn away, and think of the difficulties of a mode of truth-telling about the history that has brought us to the door of the now.